All right, guys, we're back. Inferential stats, part two. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit more about how that normal distribution is broken down into those um, percentages, right? The standardization process mm -hmm. we've discussed, and elaborate a little bit more on what I introduced as this distribution of sample means, right? If we took a hypothetical sample of 20 people, or I was talking about temperature of tea and a, a number of a population of 100 mugs, if I take 20 of those and I get a sample average of that temperature, and then I take a different 20, right? I remix those 20 in, and I take a different 20 out of there and I get it now I can t start talking about how the all the averages look alike instead of just the individual scores right so a distribution of sample means so that's what we're planning to do uh, <clears throat> let's start out by talking a little bit more about standardization and z scores so remember uh, you can have a variable like temperature and a variable like number of apples at a farm market that have no similarity in terms of their scale right they, although they're both continuous um, ratio variables the actual values they represent are very different. Temperature and quantity of, of apples are, are not easily compared, but you can start talking about whether a temperature is more or less above the average and whether or not the number of apples that day is more or less above the average number of apples that are at that farm market. And that allows you to see things like whether or not both tend to be above average or both tend to be below average, or when one's above average, the other's below average, stuff that we start looking at at correlations, right? Um, so standardization really allows you to start comparing scores, right? And we can look at a couple different z-scores and easily see um, how one compares to the other in terms of its position in this distribution. So remember, the distribution of z-scores, so all the z-scores, because the z-score is just how many standard deviations you are above or below the mean, that means the distribution of z-scores, the center point of it, will be zero because the center of the z distribution will be equivalent to the mean of the distribution of raw scores, right? And so if that's the case, then the z score for that center point for the mean would be zero. The mean itself is zero standard deviations above or below the mean itself, right? It, it is the mean, so it's right there at zero. And then every other score in there is gonna fall really close to the mean or really far from the mean, and we can represent it by how many standard deviations out it is, right? That's how that z distribution works. So we can take some raw scores. Stats exam, cognition exam, right? Two hypothetical tests um, that let's say you take, um, <clears throat> you ended up getting an 88 in stats, you got an 85 in cognition, so at least on the surface it looks like you did worse in cognition, but maybe there's more under the surface here, right? So look at the average on that stats exam. It's a 78, standard deviation of a six. So knowing that information, we can plug that into our z-score formula, right? Your score of 88 minus the mean of 78 divided by six, and we'd have a z-score then of 1.67. If we do the same thing for the cognition exam, and plug in those values, you get a z-score of 1.8. Which one's a higher above? Well, you don't even need the, the normal distribution to realize that 1.8 is higher than 1.67, which means it has a higher percentile, which means it's scoring at or below, or at or above, excuse me, a larger portion of that distribution. So while the raw score itself is three points lower, the position in the class is considerably better for the cognition exam than it is for the stats exam. That means you, you scored higher than more individuals in the class in cognition than you did in stats, right? So we can start to use that kind of analogy to talk about how unlikely an event is, right? A z-score of 1.8, you can see, is almost all the way over there at where you only have about 3%, a little less than 3% of the distribution higher than that. That means 97% of the distribution is at or below you, right? That means it's getting to be pretty unusual. Three in a hundred times will you get a score above that or, or that high. And that likelihood estimation is essentially the basis of inferential statistics, right? So you can sort of start that logical process, your own thinking, uh, in, in an example like this, right? Two, two very, very different dogs. This tiny little guy and this really, really big guy. Would you guess that the dog on the left has a positive or a negative z-score as compared to all the other dogs out there in the world? Right? So if we took a height or size estimate of all the dogs in the world and we got an average of that, do you think that little guy has a positive or a negative z-score? Hopefully you said a negative z-score, right? He is likely to be below average. And that, just, uh, that doesn't mean him himself is below average in terms of quality or he's probably a wonderful, cute little puppy. I just mean his size is small. And because that size is what we're comparing to the overall distribution, he ends up with a negative z-score because he's below the average. The guy on the right, considerably above that average, is going to have a positive z-score. The question is, how positive, how far from zero does that z-score have to be for us to say, okay, that's really unusual, 
Because if it's a z-score of 1, well, we know 68% of the population falls between one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. So that's a pretty likely thing to happen. What if it was two standard deviations out? Now we have 95% of the distribution falls between two standard deviations. So then what if you were two and a half or three standard deviations out? Now we're talking about really, really unlikely events. So let's see an example of how we use z-scores and raw scores and go back and forth. You've already done this a bunch of times, but just a refresher, you even did this as recently as um, finding your uh, slope and y-intercept in correlation regression. Um, you simply just take the z-score, multiply it by standard deviation of the population, add the mean to the population of that um, product. So it's simply the z-score formula rewritten to solve for x, right, the raw score instead of the z-score. Um, this essentially means that when we standardize two different scales to z-scores, we can now compare them directly, whereas previously we could not. Um, so that's what we want to do moving forward with this normal distribution. We want to talk a lot about how we go back and forth between z-scores and percentiles because we want to hammer this in so that you understand how a z-score represents or corresponds to a particular position in this distribution and then what that means about its position in the distribution. You just think about a hypothetical roll of die, right? You roll two dice, what's the likely outcome? Well, the most likely outcome is that you're gonna get somewhere around a six or seven, right? And so you can see all the possible ways that that would come up. A six and a one, a five and a two, a four and a three, a three and a four, a two and a five, a one and a six. So you have lots of ways in which you can get a seven. There are fewer ways in which you can end up with a six, fewer ways in which you could end up with a five or a four or a three or a two and you can't get lower than that because you have two dice right and similarly it's really unusual that you would get a 12 because there's only one way that that can come out and so you can see that these unusual events end up near the tail this is just a histogram right this is a, a frequency polygon maybe is, is better because we've got both of them here the the bars and then the superimposed uh curve it's just frequency the highly frequent events are those ones right near the mean the highly infrequent events are those ones that are way out to the sides. So how do we know more about this central limit theorem and um, how it applies to the normal distribution and how we can use that in stats? Well, actually, it's kind of a cool story. and I'll tell it to you briefly here. It's about Guinness, actually. Um, so there was a man named Gossett who was hired by Guinness, um, the brewery, of course, for quality control. Now, without getting into the particulars of how you brew beer, it requires very, very particular amounts of the ingredients that go into it. Yeast, the sugars that you get from the, the malted barley, um, all have to be in precise amounts. And then you also have to make sure you put the correct amount of beer in each bottle and in each barrel. And so there's a lot of things you have to keep track of. And so since he was hired for quality control as a sort of mathematician, statistician who knew how to approach these things, that was his job. Now, he couldn't sample everything. Sampling a beer requires taking a little sip of it, looking at the color, a handful of things you have to rate. If he sampled, <coughs> excuse me, every bottle, every barrel, every batch, he'd be wasted. And it would take way too much time. Guinness is a huge brewery, and it was back then as well. He needed a better way of estimating the average quality across all of those samples without having to do all of those samples. And essentially, he came up with the idea of central limit theorem as a way of explaining how to do this. The idea is that even though you might take a sample of one barrel and that one might be slightly off, um, and you might take a sample of another barrel and that one might be slightly off, you take averages of all of those samples. Then he knew that that overall distribution would end up being normal and would end up giving him a better picture of the quality of that particular beer and let him know then when he got a sample that seemed to be a little bit farther from that, how likely or unlikely it would be to find it again. So if that extremely unlikely event is the bad beer, then he knows that most of those beers, most of those batches are going to be fairly quality and fairly good. And so that's essentially how we came up with this central limit theorem applied to sort of statistical sampling. Um, so just a refresher, remember the central limit theorem basically says that even if the population it's drawn from is not normally distributed, right? Almost all the beer is really good, but occasionally there's a really crappy one way down here. So it's skewed, right? In this case, probably negatively skewed, assuming the the, the x-axis variable is something like quality that goes up when it's better. Um, even if that population is horribly skewed, as we take samples of it, and then we plot the distribution of all those samples, that distribution will be normally distributed, right? Unimodal, bell-shaped, mean at the very center of the distribution. Now, 
there's a catch to this as well, or something that we need to point out as well. This means that if we take a distribution of these means, these averages, that distribution is going to have less variability, right, than the variability of the raw scores, right, the individual scores. That's because an individual score that ends up being extreme, so a height of 20 inches or something ridiculous, I had a weird dream the other day that my best friend from high school, I, we were hanging out together, and he was only this tall. Right? Weird, right? If we got that really super extremely low score, that score is going to affect our average. If you remember back to the descriptive st statistics lecture, we talked about how sometimes with skewed distributions we use the median instead. That's because the mean, because it requires adding up all those scores, it's dramatically affected by an extreme score, right? An outlier like that. But even if that mean of that sample does get affected by that outlier, if we continually take more and more samples and we look at all the averages of all those samples, the average of those will be less affected by any outlier. Because even though this mean was affected by the outlier, it's not as low as the outlier itself, right? It was an average of all those scores. So this one pulled the average a little bit, but not that far. And so then when I average all of those averages, it's going to be less pulled by them because they'll have less extreme scores to pull that average, if you will. So it, perforce, it means that a distribution of means is always going to be less variable than a distribution of scores. Now, to preview, that means we're going to need a different measure of variability here in a second. We can't use standard deviation for everything. Um, an example of creating a distribution of scores, remember we talked about grabbing um, 140 students, well this is closer to about 30 students, distributing those samples across this. Um, you'll notice that once you get to about 30 observations, you will start to see a normal distribution. We saw it in the quincunx, but you could do this in your own data. Go use a random number table and figure out how to grab some numbers out of this and do it with four and then five and then just watch as your histogram grows in each section how it becomes more and more normally distributed that's just how these things work um so the distribution of means then like i said is going to be a little less variable so you can see as we add more and more individuals the distribution becomes a little bit more crunched Right? It's becoming less variable already because more scores mean that average is a little more stable. It's a little less prone to disruption by an extreme score. Once we take an average of that and we plot it with a bunch of other averages, we have that distribution of means and it's even more crunched because it's even less prone to be affected by those extreme scores because those extreme scores have already been sort of wrapped in to the other means that we have there. So as I previewed, standard deviation then isn't going to quite work to describe the variability of this distribution. It works for the distribution of raw scores because we calculated standard deviation using the raw scores, right? It tells us the variability of that. This is talking about variability of this new distribution of sample means. Thankfully, it's really easy. We have a new term it's called standard error, okay? Standard error instead of standard deviation. It's essentially the standard deviation of the distribution of means. So the measure of variability that, that tells us how far spread that distribution distribution of means is. How do we calculate it? Thankfully, it is really easy. So you remember standard deviation is that little O looking thing. It's a sigma, right? Lowercase sigma. Um, well, all we do is we add a subscript of M, right? To tell us this is the standard error or the variability of the distribution of means, hence the m down there. And you can see it's calculated by simply taking your standard deviation and dividing by the square root of the sample size. So however many individuals were in your sample, you had 40 people in your sample, the standard deviation was this for those 40 raw scores. Well, the standard error of the distribution of means, this hypothetical distribution that would be created if we took all kinds of samples of that size, right, infinite samples of that size, well, it's represented by simply the standard deviation of those scores divided by the square root of the number of scores. So in this case, square root of 40, right? Um, so fairly straightforward, real quick table to help keep track. Right, we're going to then have a mean for this distribution of means. Right, We haven't really discussed that, but we need a center point. Now, thankfully, if your sample size is large enough that it approximates the overall population, then the mean for your sample or the mean for the population will be the mean of this distribution of means. So that makes it really easy. The symbol there also has a very similar change. We talk about the mean of raw scores for a population. We use mu. When we talk about the mean of sample means for that distribution of means, we use mu with a subscript m, right? Um, standard error you saw did the same thing. We used lowercase sigma, and then we added the subscript m. All right, so really easy. The only things that we really talked about in this particular lecture are a refresher of central limit theorem, and then what this distribution of means looks like, and how we need a new measure of variability.
keep in mind the standardization stuff and all the points along that, that overall distribution because the next topic, not our next lecture, the next mo module in class is going to use that distribution to start testing hypotheses and, and what we call z-tests. Okay, so that's the end of this video. There's one more left in our introduction to inferential statistics, um, and then you can move on to the z-tests videos. All right, Meow. cheers. <laughs>